It's going to be about modeling environmental release and nano exposure within the environment. Within the environment, I mean the real environment, not environmental exposure in a, in a factory. Um, Rata will deal with that in a minute. Um, just short, Nanophase is a Horizon 2020 project. It's got an 11.3 million pound um, million euro budget, thanks to the Swiss allowing us to go over the limit now that they fund themselves. Um, we have 41 partners, four which are Swiss and seven who are non-European collaborative partners. And basically the project's about nanomaterials in the environment in terms of tracking the exposure. So where do nanoparticles go? What do they turn into when they go there? And how long does it take for them to go there? So we'll look at the whole of the release phase, all the multiple points through in the product life cycle where releases can occur. Look at the reactions that occur in the environment. So within air, once a particle is released, it will have reactions that determine whether it um, deposits or carries on in the air phase. Within soil, there'll be react reactions that determines the partitioning between the two phases in soil. Once we know all that for each column in the environment, which has air over water or air over soil, um, we can do uh, geographical tracking of where in the environment things will move, which obviously depends on inputs in terms of human population and industry locations, the elevations to river network, or what the transport media is within the environment. So that's where we're heading to, and now we'll go back to how we got there and why these things are important. Um, the Nanofake project was really a, a step on from the mass models of um, Fartry, who's going to speak afterwards, um, and, and burnt um, in terms of how much is the production levels, where will things go, you know, which routes do they take to uh, to waste handling and, and eventual deposition. Our task in Nanofake was to look at consumer products, um, commercial consumer products that would be used and go down the drain either through showers or washing machines or whatever you could imagine. So the thing was to work out how much, then work out where it went when it came to the sewage works. And Ralph will talk about the details of this bit here later. And it's basically working, you know, the basics of it is working out the split between what would go in the effluent to the river and what would go to the soil. And the first thing is to look at, will it cause any effects? So the two first bits is working out the maps of where things would go in, in the rivers and where they would go in soils. And then try and compare that with hazard data, which is obviously de developed in the lab, where you expose things to higher and higher concentration, nice clean conditions where you can measure the nanoparticles and everything else. Work out what dose you need to get to before things become unhappy then plot the distribution of sensitivities of all the species you've measured, um, and then use that distribution to derive the concentration where you're likely to affect 5% of the species that are out there, including the 5% all the species you didn't test or can't test. And then, depending on how much data you have, you'll apply a safety factor of up to 1,000 to that number to get to what you think is your safe concentration in the environment, and then compare the two. The exercise you're going to do later is basically on trying to um, set you up for realising how basic the data is that we start with and how big the safety factors we put on at the end is, so you can get a bit more realistic about to what uh, degree of detail it's going to be useful to model the middle bit. So we'll have a part one on water, then a part two on soil. There's exercises for both. Um, in terms of water, the way we've predicted exposure is basically along all the 1.2 kilometers of EU rivers. Estimated the annual production taken out of, of this paper. You could take it out of any paper. You could make it up. You could say it up by 10. doesn't matter, but you need a number to start with. Assume even use by all people in Europe, no industrial point sources, this is everything goes into the hair, hair lotion, that, uh, whatever gets used, and every person in Europe uses the same. And to make it the worst case for the water, we'll assume that nothing is removed in the sewage works, then we we'll plot where all the sewage works are, how much river water there is, there is in the river to dilute it, and then you get concentration maps for each river stretch that you can imagine across Europe. Um, 
These are the concentration maps we came up with. Um, from the HACID data, we get these PNAC values for civil and nanoparticles, so the predicted no effect concentrations in the environment are these. Um, if you take it down to silver ions, it's obviously more toxic by a reasonable factor. And if you take the assumption of it being nanoparticles out there, you can see there's red and orange areas in Europe where we think uh, the predicted environmental concentration will exceed or get close to the predicted no effect concentration. So there are problems. If you assume it all dissolves to ions um, and are presented in the environment as ions, you can see there's all of a sudden a big problem. So either there is a nano problem in EU waters or using standard worst cases, too simple. So what else do we need to include? So if we take these maps and turn them into frequency distribution, so instead we have the percentage of EU rivers that exceeds a certain concentration, uh, predicted concentration. So you obviously have few kilometres of river or a few percent of kilometres of river that have very high concentrations and most of them exceed the concentration. Um, and then you plot where our predicted safe limits are for the environmental concentrations. The assumptions are still the same, but if we try and look at those assumptions, you can see that we assumed no removal of wastewater. Well, in the wastewater treatment plant, if you assume 50% removal, obviously your exposure concentration is going to go down 50%. You can make that 99% and you'd move it back to 100. Um, Equally on the hazard side, we could look at improving the data we have so we don't have to use such high safety factors on the estimates we have. We could look at probably actually it's not going to be silver out there, it's not going to be silver ions, it's going to be some aged form of silver that's a lot less reactive than either of those. So probably the safe concentration lies way to the right of the hazard data we have for the pristine materials people are testing in the lab. We also assumed there was going to be no sedimentation in the river. Well, anybody who's tried putting a nanoparticle in anything that just has a little bit of salt or a little bit of clay in it will know that usually it falls out pretty quickly. So obviously that needs to be taken into concern. So if we just look quickly at those two elements um, and look at modelling the availability across EU water types. So we've taken all the water types within the EU water framework, so across all the rivers in Europe, done multivariate analysis on them and found six groups we can turn them into in terms of water classes around Europe. And then taken the geometric mean of those water classes and made that up as an experimental treatment and tested how the Dubai length, uh, which is uh, the, the, the length you'll have between particles before they sediment out, um, is affected by water classes. And you can see in certain water classes you have long Dubai lengths, which means you have um, a longer time that they will stay in suspension. And you can see that where we had green areas for low exposure, we have red areas now, so that's where the, the particles will stay in the water. So although we have low levels going into Norwegian waters, they will stay there a longer time. Luckily, all the red areas we have in Europe is where the waters are so ionically strong, has so much organic matter and other stuff in it that the particles will sediment, sediment out pretty quickly. So we haven't got a water toxicity issue, but obviously somebody needs to look at the sediment because particles aren't removed, they just go from there. Equally, um, we can look at the aged particles, and here's some TOPS data from the TINY project, where we have iron, you know, silver ions, we have silver pristine particles, manufactured nanoparticles, particles, and then we have sulfidized particles. And if you look at the axis here, you can see, in terms of killing half the nematodes, you can only get to about seven micrograms per litre if you're using silver. If you're using silver nanoparticles, the concentration is about 10 times higher. If you're using sulfidized silver particles, well, even when you go to excessively much higher concentrations, you know, 100 times higher than the what killed half of them doesn't even kill 20% of them. So the form is incredibly important and we need to track that. And it's obviously not realistic that what went down the shower is what comes out into the environment. So that's the bit we have to keep track of. In soil, the calculations are reasonably simple. I've taken out the numbers because that's the exercise. Um, you've got to look at which country you'd like to be in and how much of the sludge that each sewage producing population puts on their land is. You know, if you go to Iceland, then there's not going to be a land problem because they put it all underground. If you go to Holland, that's not going to be a land problem because they incinerate it all. 
if you go to the UK or Portugal or Italy, most of it goes to fertilise the land. So you can use all those data to calculate how much of the particles that are used goes onto the land. If we look at a real world scenario in this transatlantic project, we tried to set up a pilot plant and actually do three lines of treatment. We had a control, we had one where we put ionic zinc and silver loads in, and one where we put zinc and silver in as nanoparticles. Went to the highest allowed limit for US soils, um, and then took the sludge cake we got out of it, mixed it into soils, left them outside for six months in the rain, so we had realistic exposure media in, in soil at the right concentration. Then went and did the tests, um, and if you look at this, you can see that the soil control and the one with the sewage sludge in it, they, they reproduce much more in sewage sludge, but that's just a fact of what earthworms eat, and when you eat more, you reproduce more, if you're an earthworm at least. Um, and then we had the ionic treatments and the nanoparticle treatments, and you can see we had some effect of these lower treatments, not even the highest ionic treatment caused an effect, which is good when we were putting in the, what was supposed to be the safe limit, the high end of the safe limit. But when the particle, when the metals had arrived as nanoparticles into the sewage works, we actually only had 10% of the reproduction potential of the earthworms left. So the fact that they arrived as nanoparticles meant that they behaved differently and caused effects where we wouldn't have predicted them even if we had assumed ionic um, strength toxicity had exactly the same effect on plants. So this is uh, clover, which fixes nitrogen by having these nodule, bacteria nodules uh, in symbiosis with the roots. And when you put nanoparticles in there instead of ions, there was none of those nodules left, and we had no nitrogen fixation of the clover. So, you know, at realistic, high-end realistic concentrations and recent, as realistic as we can make it, we get effects where we wouldn't expect them can't explain why. You look, you go to the synchrotron. They all, you know, the the way the silver and the zinc are presented in these two, based on everything we can analyse, is the same. But there's obviously something different going on when they arrive as nanoparticles. Here you can see in all the treatments the split between different zinc forms are exactly the same. Um, you can also see if you go to the lab, you take zinc oxide and you you react it at different concentrations, you get co totally different zinc forms. You can either get a very small set of zinc sulfide particles or zinc oxide will phosphatize either with a shell or it will form big hope pipe plates. So the reaction conditions of what happens to a nanoparticle on the way to the environment or in the environment is incredibly important for what it is the organisms will meet out there. And it usually has very little to do with the particles that were made in the first place. I mean, there's no zinc oxide left after this treatment. After this treatment. So no zinc oxide would have gone on the land. Um, Guard Nano is one of the projects that are working on this, trying to model from activities based on commercial products what the releases will be, what the environmental fate will be, and then predicting that into hazard concentrations where we're trying to use as much of the data we can to make sure the hazard evaluation we do is on a relevant particle. So it's on an exposure relevant particle. We're not using silver elemental particle data directly to compare with what we think is kind of come out in silver sulfide terms. Nanophase, as I said, is going to try and do this, but track everything from any product, for any release route, through any into any environment, and try and track it in the geographical sense. Now, your exercise is going to be very simple. Um, Ralph's going to try and run you through how much we're going to have to try and keep track of in just one of these waste management uh, scenarios, just so you can see what kind of data it is we have to keep track of in terms of your ontologies and how we link that exposure characterisation to the hazard studies that people are doing in the lab. So I'll hand over to Ralph now. I don't know how many minutes he hasn't got left.